Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this press conference from the 50th anniversary of the World Economic Forum here in Davos. Uh, you've seen it, you heard it, you've read it. Climate, climate change, fighting climate change is definitely one of the headline topics uh, of this press conference. Yesterday and today the headlines were dominated by two of the participants uh, here in Davos, clearly uh, Greta Thunberg uh, and uh, Donald Trump. But um, as it's in the name, World Economic Forum, um, it's also important to have a look what the private sector is doing in that space. Um, this press conference is dedicated um, to uh, exactly that topic. It's under the headline, Financial Giants Moving Trillions to Attain Net Zero Carbon. Quite an ambition, uh, um, ambitious title, uh, even, even for the World Economic Forum. Um, what happened last year is that some of the largest investors in the private sector joined forces to radically reduce the global carbon emissions by ensuring that their portfolios, their investments, uh, would be carbon neutral by 2050. Um, we hope this press conference can mark a milestone in this uh, alliance, in this uh, initiative. Um, the 16 existing members uh, are very happy to announce that the family is getting bigger here. Um, and, uh, but we also want to hear what have been the concrete steps uh, that, the, uh, that the Alliance took and, um, and what's the way forward. What's the way forward? You heard yesterday from Greenpeace as well, business is not doing enough. You heard from Greta, business is not doing enough. You heard from President Trump a slightly different approach. He spoke about the profits of doom when it came to climate change. So where in this colorful mix is the private sector? Where in this colorful mix are also other large uh, investors? Um, I'm pleased to be joined by an expert panel to discuss uh, this question update, uh, both you, members of the media here in the room, and our audience on the live stream uh, on, on the progress uh, on that front. Uh, on my immediate left, I'm joined by Christiana Figueres. She's the conveyor of Mission 2020. And um, for those of you um, who might remember, um, she was also the executive secretary at the UNFCCC, so uh, quite uh, uh, an illustrious commitment to, to fighting climate change. To her immediate left, we're joined by Günther Tallinger, who's the uh, chair of uh, the Alliance um, and um, is the chief investment officer of Allianz. So um, two, two different alliances, one, of course, uh, a, a member company of the forum and one exactly this net uh, zero alliance we're, we're talking about here today. To his immediate left, uh, we're joined by Tom Joy, who's the director of investments at Church Commissioners for England. So um, I'm not saying you're a suspect, Tom, but you're definitely not one of the usual suspects uh, to find here uh, in that space. So we're very happy to have you. And last but definitely not least, we're joined by Guido Führer, who is the Group Chief Investment Officer of Swiss Re. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Christiana, without further ado, give us a quick summary um, of uh, how the discussions have been going so far. and. Um, Tell us a little bit about why you think the engagement from the private sector is so crucial to achieve the goals. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for taking the time today. Um, I would just like to, uh, first of all, congratulate uh, Gunter for leading the charge here, Allianz for leading the charge, and say this is something that is also being highly supported by UNEP FI, UNEP uh, Finance Initiative. Um, and we're very excited about the Asset Owner uh, Alliance because if, if there is a food chain in the financial sector, um, then asset owners are at the top of the food chain. And uh, asset managers do need to take heed of the direction that they get from, as, uh, from asset owners, as well as companies if they're being uh, directly invested in by the asset owners. So either through either route, uh, there are. Uh, it's a very powerful signal when a critical mass of asset owners around the world that are currently at four trillion, but soon to grow, stay tuned, uh, actually come to together to, um, to support each other in ensuring that their portfolios that they hold will not exceed 1.5 degrees. Um, and uh, what has been a very uh, interesting conversation today was the first ever conversation between the members of that alliance, between the asset owners and some of the companies that they hold. 
um, and a conversation around what can be done in order to help these companies for them to get their companies to protect the 1.5 degree ceiling. Um, in recognition of the fact that the asset owners may be completely committed to this, but if the companies don't move, they cannot deliver on their commitment. And, uh, and the companies equally, uh, they may or may not be currently committed, but they need the financial backing for the transition that is not always an easy transition. So a very clear recognition that it needs to be uh, an effort on both sides. We were, uh, we were quite impressed that uh, the conversation was one that there was appetite for, obviously initiated by the asset owners, but the corporations actually not just willing to speak, but having a very clear appetite for this dialogue, not one that was finished today, far from it. Uh, that dialogue will continue, but uh, at least started off on a very good note. Three points that I think I would, uh, I would summarize from the conversation. There was a clear call for more rigor, uh, more rigor in the accounting, more rigor in the reporting, more rigor in the metrics, uh, and that is really important in order to, for transparency and in order to be able to keep track of whether we're moving forward with decarbonization or not. There was also a clear call to, yes, this is a very good start of uh, a relatively small group, of both companies and asset owners, but a clear call to expand the, bound, the current boundary to other geographies, both in terms of asset ownership as well as uh, in terms of, um, uh, uh, of companies in order to make this a whole global economy movement forward. And the third, and I think the most important, was a real commitment on both sides, on everyone to collaborate with each other. There are some sectors that are easy to abate but in particular those sectors that are hard to abate. There's no need to reinvent the wheel um, and, and open uh, a, uh, a call for open source scenarios and tools that everyone in the same sector can use in order to make apples be apples and in order to accelerate uh, the learning ground from which uh, everyone is starting. Thank you. Uh, Gunta, you're not just here as the Chief Investment Officer of Allianz, but you're also chairing the, the steering board of the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. So you're the right person to ask, what are, what are the plans going forward? So we heard it's still a relatively small group. Um, so how, what's going to happen next, please? Yeah. First of all, I should start out with uh, the commitment that these 16 as owners uh, made. Um, the commitment uh, is indeed Net Zero 2050. Some people uh, misunderstand this a little bit uh, and believe this means uh, net zero 2050, nothing happens uh, till close to 2050. Quite the contrary is the fact. The, the group of asset owners is now working especially on how can we measure the carbon footprint of these entire portfolios. And as uh, Christiane already said, we are well, well uh, above 4 trillion in, in terms of uh, total assets. So what's the carbon footprint of these more than 4 uh, trillion? And then we are working on what is a very first step into the direction of net zero uh, 2050. And you should expect that uh, during the course of this year, obviously we have COP26 uh, coming up, so a very clear uh, deadline. During the course of this year, we are coming with uh, this uh, a target of a very first uh, step, what the reduction uh, then means. And in that sense, it starts to become very, very concrete. And as Christiana said, the discussion with corporates that we uh, started now really in a larger group, individual discussions with corporates we always had in a certain form, but now, uh, let's say, really in a larger group is of the essence uh, here because uh, the target that we will define during the course of the year will be um, supported by measures that we are working on with those corporates. And that's why uh, we believe we really talk about something that is quite transformational uh, for perhaps uh, various areas, not only the investing uh, space. Just because you asked what uh, is going to happen, so this is one uh, part. The other part that uh, certainly is going to happen, and you are going uh, to hear perhaps um, in a few seconds, we want to really expand the group um, of asset owners. Uh, we want to uh, actually work uh, very, very hard to cover uh, areas that are so far not that well represented. And I uh, mention especially Asia. Um, and I mention this because we really, really invite uh, asset owners from that region 
to join us. He would be very uh, much welcomed. And let's see uh, what progress we can make there. So thank you for this. Thank you very much. So um, enough of the teasers already. Uh, Tom, you're joining this panel for a very particular reason and for a wonderful reason. So please uh, share, share with us, share with the audience uh, why you're here. I'm happy to. So I'm Tom Joy, CIO of the Church Commissioners, and I'm delighted um, to be here today to announce our, our joining of the um, Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, along with the other national uh, investing bodies. I mean, cha ch climate change is really the challenge of our of our age. Um, at the Church of England, we've been at the forefront of action, uh, investor action on climate change. We have a common policy in terms of engaging with companies, with policymakers, and progressively reallocation of capital away from the high carbon and businesses of the past to the net zero uh, economy of the future. So joining this alliance is very much a natural um, step for us, but it's also a vital step uh, because we're asking companies uh, to get to net zero by 2015. So it's important that we ask ourselves uh, to, do, to do the same. And we believe that we're at an exciting um, tipping, tipping point. The Church of England has always been involved uh, in responsible uh, investment, but the pace of change we're seeing in the financial community uh, is really remarkable. And we think by working together, we really uh, stand a chance of setting the, 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 the world economy on a path uh, on a, to, to achieve um, the goals set out in the Paris Agreement. One of our strengths has always been, um, you know, engaging with uh, companies, and we've been increasing our resources uh, to do that. Church of England has been um, involved in some, um, uh, you know, um, very important um, uh, engagement successes uh, on climate change with companies, for example, from BP. Uh, to ensure that its capital expenditure is consistent uh, with the goals of the Paris Agreement, with Shell to halve its carbon footprint by 2050, uh, with Glencore to cap its global coal production, and then with US electric, uh, electric utility Duke Energy to uh, be net zero by 2050. So these are, are positive developments, but we need to, to do more. And, and we have a long track record um, that shows that actually incorporating responsible investment and ESG uh, into your process, you can still achieve outstanding financial results as, as, as our track record um, uh, attains to. So we, you know, we are undoubted that the announcement we're making here will serve our beneficiaries uh, in the future. And as a perpetual endowment, uh, a fund that's here uh, not just for current generations, but for all future generations, um, this uh, is, is such of paramount importance uh, and, and is why we're joining the um, uh, alliance today. Thank you very much. Um, so things are happening, there is progress, but Guido, 2050 is, is quite a couple of years away from us yet. And if you talk to a lot of the climate activists here in the building, also definitely if you would talk to the protesters outside the building who are saying this is not going fast enough, it needs to be much faster, uh, more has to happen quicker. Um, how do you space out these, these actions over the, over the years until 2050? Please. I think it's a very fair question. Uh, just think about uh, when we started this journey, uh, you need to first agree how you measure basically progress. That's why one of the working stream, which we also call it together with uh, Allianz, is actually focusing on that, how we measure progress, how we measure the specific targets which we want to achieve. But it's also about reporting. One is measuring, but I think we want to also engage not only amongst us, but also with the portfolio company, how best should be reported about uh, carbon and other relevant uh, pieces. And ultimately, also verification. Based on that, we will define clear interim target. We will have at least every fifth year a target which we want to achieve. And I just want to give you one example. Uh, Swiss Re, uh, a global reinsurance company, we started to focus on climate many years ago. Uh, three years ago, we made a major decision to switch to so-called ESG benchmark, environment, social and governance benchmark. Since we switched, we could reduce the carbon intensity of our portfolio in the equity piece by 52%. On the corporate bond side, which is another allocation of each uh, insurance company and many other institutional investors, we could reduce by 42%. So basically, we halved the carbon intensity or the carbon footprint by almost 50%. That's why with relatively reasonable measure, you can achieve a lot. And that's why I'm looking very much forward together with other asset owner to make it a joint journey and defined joint targets. 
Thank you very much. Uh, before I open the, the floor to question and answers, and I think um, you mentioned already you want to, to engage more Asian companies, but looking at the 16 or now 17 members, one can't help but notice that it's still very strongly European-based. Um, when you're speaking to your peer, peers here from the investors community in Davos, do you feel that message is being heard everywhere with the urgency it, it needs to be heard? Please. Well, um, I do. I do believe indeed the message um, is very much uh, heard. There are, as you rightly say, uh, indeed now. Uh, let's say with with the colleagues around uh, Tom, really other asset owners uh, coming in, uh, very prominent ones. Um, asset owners that are really leading in the area of uh, sustainable uh, investing. Uh, but by now, we can also say that, uh, let's say, in terms of uh, e e Europe, really almost the entire European uh, insurance industry is very strongly represented. Because what we also can announce uh, here today is that, uh, let's say, in addition to all the names that you can find already on uh, the web page, uh, also Generali Insurance uh, is going uh, to join us, and they are very happy with us uh, announcing this here in uh, e e this, at this conference. So um, in terms of Europe, you are fully right. We, we develop a very, very good um, position. And we also believe we can move here uh, already quite something. But yes, we have this discussion with other asset owners and they're especially uh, about their context. And that is something that we uh, need to be very honest about. The context in terms of uh, e policy making, but also, uh, let's say, the communication uh, from the, the various politi uh, political uh, sides is something that we, to a certain degree, really rely a little bit on how we can expand. And we really hope for um, the other jurisdictions to be more open in terms of uh, promoting their asset owners to join us. That's almost uh, a request that would certainly alleviate the decision making for these asset owners, especially, uh, we believe, in, uh, in some Asian countries. And there, as you know, they are really very, very relevant uh, asset owners whom we really would like uh, us to join. Yeah. Make it a request, not, not just almost a request. So if you're watching and representing one of these, one of these organizations, um, get, get to work. We have uh, questions from the floor. Um, we have a microphone coming, especially for the sake of our online audience. If you could state your name and organization, please. Thank you. Great. Catherine Cunningham. Um, I'm with Thrive, Natural Intelligence Media, and Eurovision News and Events. And my question is, if it was, um, seems relatively easy once you do the metrics and you really look at the, um, the, the gains um, in reducing uh, a carbon footprint, you said you've reached the, the 52 and 40 percent mark um, and having carbon reductions uh, with a number of your companies that you work with. Was that just the, the low-hanging fruit? And, and now we're sort of looking at the, the next 50% of offset if we're looking to get to carbon neutrality, maybe in a carbon negative future. Um, will that, that transition for the next 50%, um, will that be more difficult? Um, will it require true transformation of companies? Will that transformation require um, capital investment? I was at a panel yesterday with Mark Carney, um, London, Bank of London, and he suggested that the real narrative now and the real question is, you know, what's your plan for the transition? That this is really the key question. So maybe you could Thank you. elaborate on that. I think it's a very good question. Uh, no doubt that uh, the, first, the first 50 percent uh, is, is doable within the current framework. We will only achieve net zero by 2050 if you have portfolios portfolio companies which you can invest, which have done the transition. And that's why I strongly believe it needs long-term investor like uh, you, you see here represented. Because ultimately, if I believe in the United Nations IPCC figure, they believe we need to invest 2.4 trillion a year, the next 15 years to make that. Now, pension fund, uh, but also insurance companies, sovereign wealth fund, we together manage over 80 trillion. Now, 2.4 is, is a big amount, no doubt, but not completely impossible to achieve. If we start to channel our money towards the right direction, if we have the right framework, that's achievable. 
That's why we rely that companies shift. That's why we engage out of this asset owner alliance. We not only invest, but also we engage with the sectors and with the company to make this transition possible. But as I've mentioned before, it needs not only private sector, it needs also public sector. We need to have a, a cooperation because a cooperation basically allows to agree on standards. And standard goes in reporting, accounting, and other, other things which are important. Only then we believe uh, we, can, we can achieve it. The reason why is we three joined this asset owner alliance is, I think it's, yes, these are asset owner, as Christiana has mentioned, we are very important part of the food chain. But ultimately, uh, we, we are credible because we committed to specific figure. That's why I feel this is an area which we want to engage in order to jointly take the challenge which we have. Thank you. Thank you. Christiana, um, how optimistic are you that the second half yeah. of the work gets done? Yeah, and I'd love to compliment that um, be because I think it's important to understand that when you go to a company, as this Asset Owner Alliance is doing, and asking them to decarbonize because otherwise their portfolios can't be decarbonized, you have to understand how a company goes at that. First, they go to the carbon that is fully under their control. That means the carbon of their operations, and they go for first efficiency, and they move to renewable energy, and they look at you know every, everything that is under their control. Um, then, of course, they will look at scope two, which is how does how is that um, actually beyond their own um, operations. But then the most important part of almost every single sector is scope three, which is the suppliers. And that is not fully under their control. So, you know, just yesterday I spoke to um, one of the um, leaders here of the fashion industry, second most polluting industry in the world right after fossil fuel. And at least for this company, or, or in general, 90% of the emissions of the fashion industry are in the suppliers. And for this particular company, 95. So now you can really understand the complexity of this, right? Because it's not just what you can do within your own manufacturing plants, within your own transport, within your own, you know, every, every, the whole operations that you fully control. Now you're asking, you're going to have a much more complex conversation with your suppliers to say, I have a commitment to 1.5 or to climate neutrality by X date, um, and therefore you need to do it as well. Um, and so we shouldn't fall into the simplistic thinking that once a company or, in fact, an asset owner assumes a certain target and by a certain date that they have that fully under their control. What they're doing is they're raising the flag, they're setting a target, and then they need to actually pull the whole cavalry in to help deliver on that. That is the good news. It makes it more complex, but the good news is that there are ripple effects that go way beyond the asset owner or the particular company, way much, you know, much more into the fabric of the economy. So it's both the difficulty as well as the advantage. Thank you. We have another question, please. My name is Hannes Koch. I'm with Tageszeit und Taz Berlin, among others. Uh, Mr. Tallinger, I would like to know whether you could give some more uh, details, concrete figures maybe, on um, how fast you would be able to shift amounts of money. Um, because um, yesterday, um, Allianz CEO Oliver Bete said that it shouldn't go too fast and that he can't put too much pressure on his own company in terms of speed shifting amounts of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, he, I would say it's quite clear that, uh, he, that one expects uh, that there must be money shifted. Um, he, he, the money shifting is, in essence, divesting in some area and investing in some other area. Now, this is clearly a step that an investor should consider. But for us, this is a form of an ultimate step, the divesting especially, uh, simply because we believe we actually can make 
um, or achieve a much, much bigger uh, impact by working with the companies we are invested in or we finance or the assets we are invested in. If we work with those assets, we actually have a good, good chance uh, to do indeed value creation. And that's actually what an investor is really looking for, an asset that overall evolves. And therefore, the divesting is something that is really uh, a little bit a difficult uh, element. Now, I do not want to uh, kind of not answer the question, uh, because there's always the, the, the kind of the idea how fast can we act. In terms of fast acting, I ask to please let us define the target, as I said, uh, let's say during the course of the year, how our portfolio, the carbon footprint, is going uh, to develop in the first step. That will quite clearly give a good understanding of what the speed is. Yeah? It's not necessary that behind that we really have then shifted money, but we have actually a very clear plan how to work with companies. And yes, it is the case. In some forms, there might be also a little bit of shifting uh, in there. But as I said, it's more the ultimate step. The much more important thing is to engage with companies and let them, together with us, develop their sustainability agenda. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions from the floor? If not, um, Tom, let me ask you. Um, Christiana mentioned the first step is always working on your own operations, right? Can you talk a little bit about some concrete things that, uh, that you have done as the Church of England? Because I'd imagine your operations look quite different from, from your other uh, colleagues here on the panel. Um. Yes. Um, well, in terms of things we, we have done from a sort of positive environment, mental um, aspect, you know, we have a reasonable allocation to venture capital. I mean, one of the solutions um, uh, to climate change will be technological. Um, and so, you know, having a, a meaningful allocation to, to, to start up venture capital, we hope in time will, you know, help deliver the technologies that we will need to make this transition. We also, you know, have roughly about 4% of the portfolio in sustainable forestry. Now that's, as we heard at, at our discussion earlier this morning, that that, that is obviously great. Uh, obviously having a sustainable forestry portfolio um, is good from a sort of carbon capture perspective. But ultimately, the, you know, when the trees are fully grown, they'll, they'll, it will only be carbon neutral. But that's still an important uh, step. We, we, we also... Um, uh, invest in what we would call win-win investments. So, you know, waste to energy, for example, we have a me you know a fairly meaningful allocation to that in the U.S. So we are very much looking for um, renewable investment opportunities on our land that we own in in, in the U.K. Uh, and and globally, um, as well as as as, as going to said engaging, you know, upping our resources to engage with companies because I do. Uh, to, to sort of answer across the two questions that were, 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 were asked earlier, yes, capital has to shift uh, into, into renewable technology uh, and new opportunities, but the climate uh, crisis will not be solved unless the transition happens. You know, divestment is not the answer to the climate uh, problem. Uh, that, won't, that won't sadly solve. Uh, while ultimately, as asset owners, we always retain that right. If companies just refuse to listen to, to our engagement, ultimately, um, you know, it, it, it will be that we'll have to divest, but it won't solve the climate crisis. We have to engage. So dedicating uh, more resources to that internally, upping our game, as it were, on the engagement front to really have some more wins, like the ones I talked about uh, in my opening remarks, uh, is, is what we're doing. Thank you very much. Um, so it is clear it's a very complex challenge, but there's reason uh, to be to be optimistic. The the alliance is growing. Mindful of the time and the full schedule of everyone here on the of the panel, uh, let me thank you, uh, thank you for for being here on the panel for giving us this update, uh, and thank you for watching and being here in the room. Thank you very much. Yeah.